Salvation Now podcast, where you'll discover and be equipped with keys from the Word of God that will pave the way to God's unlimited blessing in your life. Now, here's your host, Evangelist T.J. Malkanji. Let's continue part two, 15 lies the devil wants to make you believe. Before I get in, I want to read the same scripture I started out Tuesday's broadcast with. Uh, I want to read it again. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and beginning with verse 25. This is what the Bible says. In humility, correct those who are in opposition if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses. I want to pause there. Everything we do is to bring the truth to people so that people can come to their senses. Why? Because Jesus said in John 8, 32, if you are my disciples, you will continue in my word and you will know the truth and the truth that you know and apply, Jesus said, will set you free. We as, I'm an evangelist. We have an evangelistic ministry. When we go out and preach, we give altar calls. We we we. We plead with people to come to Christ, to make a decision for Christ. But if all people do is make a decision for Christ, and I've seen this a lot, is you have people that have an encounter with Jesus, but they don't move on to becoming a disciple. They don't move into the discipleship process, whereby we enter into lasting freedom. There's a lot of people that they they have a little taste, and they get this, this temporal freedom, this temporal sense of freedom. They have this three months stretch a sabbatical almost from what the devil was doing in their life but because they don't engage in what I'm about to talk to you today which is the absorption of truth it ends it's a it's a very la- uh, a, a fleeting freedom but God doesn't want you to have fleeting freedom God wants you to have a, a lasting freedom the Bible says The way to do it is as a newborn babe. The moment you make a decision for Christ, that's not the end of the road. There's all these people that say the moment you come to Christ, you know, that's the end of the road. That's that's the end all. Now the next step is heaven. No, there's all there's a, a, a full Bible that God wants you to learn about, to have revelation knowledge of, and to walk in so that you can maximize your potential here on the earth. Remember, the thief, the devil, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Satan has one objective with you. And we see it evident in Mark chapter 5. Do you remember the story of the Gadarene demoniac when Jesus... Uh, approached the, the, the seashore of the Gadarenes, that demon-possessed man who couldn't be bound with shackles, couldn't be bound with chains. He couldn't, nobody could help him. He tried medical help. He tried psychiatry. He tried, you know, uh, all the medication they pitched at him. He, they tried to even tame him and bind him with shackles and chains, but nothing worked on a natural level because life is not natural. Life is supernatural because the supernatural was before the natural. And everything that happens in the supernatural affects the natural. So they tried natural methods and means, but it didn't work. That's why I always tell people, psychology, it, it, it just deals with two aspects of man. It deals with the physical aspect, the biological effects, and then the psyche. That's why psychology comes from the word, the study of psyche. Psyche is the Greek word for uh, for the mind. So it, it only deals with two parts of a man, which is the mind of man and the body of a man. But man is a tripartite being. There's the spirit first and foremost, then there's the soul, and then there's the body. You are a spirit being primarily. You have a soul and you live in a body. And that's why psychology doesn't have the answer to everything. That's why there's a lot of Christians that, re- there's a lot of, not Christians, just people in general that remain depressed after they're, 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 they're pitched all kinds of medication. They're given shock treatment. They're done, they've done everything to help them and they're sincerely trying to help them, but it doesn't work because there is the core of man that needs to be impacted and touched. And the only one and the only thing that can get to the core 
of man, Hebrews 4.12 says, it is the word of God that is quick and active. It is living and it is powerful. It is eternal and it is, it is never ending. And the Bible says it's quick and active and it pierces to the division of the spirit and the soul. Only the word of God can get to the man's, to man's spirit. Only the word of God can produce the change that man so desires to have and looks elsewhere for. That's why you have people, they try fame, they try money, they try woman, they try alcohol, they try drugs, they try sex, they try everything everything but nothing can fulfill the very craving that man has because only God's word can touch the spirit of a man that's why we take time to teach the word of God I had someone recently come into one of our meetings and uh, I was out in the green room waiting to come out before the meeting started and this guy, he, he had gone to one of the ushers and said, hey, can you have TJ come out? I want him to pray for deliverance for me. And I just said, uh, I'll, I'll pray for you after the service. I'll pray, you know. And then he actually told the usher, wait, I have to wait. I have to sit through the service to actually get prayer? This is crazy. And you know what? That just reveals such a gap in people's minds, a gap in their knowledge of how God operates. You, th- you see, people just want a quick fix. They don't want to hear the word of God. They don't want to hear how God does things. They just want him to do something something. They just want the abracadabra type of solution, this magic potion that God has tucked away under his sleeve just to, you know, give them the breakthrough. There's so many people that come up to me after and they say, can I have special prayer? You know, I just laid hands on everyone, including them, but then they say, can I have special prayer? And it's as if I'm keeping something away and I was just waiting for that person to come. You know, I have regular prayer for everyone, but I'm waiting after the service so I can give people special prayer. You know, it's a lack of understanding of how God operates. The Bible says Jesus taught and he preached and then he demonstrated God's power. That's why I'm going through the 15 lies the devil pitches to our generation that keeps them bound. Because when, when, when you don't know the truth of the word, the lies of the enemy act as, as chains to keep people bound. That's what I was about to read here. If God would grant them repentance so that they may know the truth, and in knowing the truth, they may come to their senses. You ever hear the term, man, a light bulb went up in me? A light bulb just light, lit up in me? Man, I feel like light just went on. Well, that's what Paul's saying here. When you, when you know the truth, you come to your senses. The light switches go on. And what happens when the light goes on? The Bible says, and then they will escape the snare of the devil. Hallelujah. It's not hard to escape the snare of the devil. Religion tries to make it difficult. And there's a lot of so-called deliverance ministers out there. And I'm not against uh, deliverance. We, we cast out devils. But I'm saying there's a lot that love to like almost v- venerate the devil. They revere the devil. They talk so highly about him as if he's some uh, this insurmountable fool, this amazing being that God created that we're cut out for our work. There's no way we're going to defeat him. There's no way we have a chance against them but reality is the devil is a defeated being the bible says he's under your feet that you've been seated far above principalities and powers that the enemy has only one legal right and legal place that he can stay in your life that's not in your head that's not in your body it's under your feet but when people don't know the truth it gives them a foothold remember in ephesians 4 paul says that we should not give the devil a foothold lest he should take advantage of us lest he should manipulate us lest he should harass us lest he should uh, bully us there's too many Christians being bullied by the being, the devil that we're called to bully we're not to be bullied we're to be doing the bullying we're not to be harassed we're supposed to be anointed of the Holy Ghost doing the harassing uh, totally demolishing the work of the devil everywhere we go the Bible says says, I give you power to trample upon serpents and scorpions, not to tolerate, not to coexist with, not to say, oh, the devil's got, he's got on my back, and I don't know what, no, to trample, to trample, to literally crush under your feet, to have a forceful dominion over the devil and his forces, and the way Paul says you attain to that is when you come to your senses through the knowledge of the truth, and thereby escape the snare 
snare of the devil. Because when you're in the snare of the devil, you've been taken captive by him to do his will. Paul says, I'm going to read it in its entirety without stopping now, just so you get the full gist of what Paul's saying. If God perhaps would grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snares of the devil, having been taken captive by him, to do his will. The way the devil takes people captive. He makes men captive, women captive. That he keeps people in perpetual bondage in this vicious cycle of, of, of frustration and destruction. The way he does it is by keeping them ignorant to the word of God. And I went through this. I'm giving you just a synopsis of what I talked about on Tuesday just to catch people up. But the word of God, the Bible says it is the light of God. The entrance of his word brings light. The devil is called the prince of darkness. Darkness doesn't have anything to do with the absence of, uh, of a physical light. When the Bible talks about darkness and the devil being the prince of darkness, it doesn't mean he just comes out at 12 at midnight or at 3 a.m. in the morning. It means that he operates in... In darkness, meaning ignorance. He operates best when men are ignorant of what God has said. I talked about how in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve, the way the devil made them captives was through getting them to doubt the integrity of God's word. And in doing so, it literally it, 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 it got them to adopt a new belief system. And then the wrong belief system led to their ensnarement. It led to their captivity. The devil does that. He tried to do it with Jesus in the wilderness when he was fasting and praying. Did God really say, I, I, it, 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 are you really the son of God? Do you really think you're the son of God? Jesus said, man loves not by bread alone. He resisted the temptation. He didn't even give him, he didn't even give him an answer to what, to what, uh, what, what, what he was saying. Jesus never entertained the devil. There's too many Christians that entertain the devil. There's too many Christians that love to communicate with the devil. Jesus didn't even entertain him. He just, he just declared the word of God in the face of the opposition, and it led to the devil leaving. That's why the Bible says, resist the devil, and he will flee. He'll flee. So I said this on Tuesday, if he's not fleeing, then either A, you're not resisting at all, or B, you're not resisting properly. But I'm going to show you today how you can resist properly. The Bible says in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. He was in the beginning with God. And the scripture says, the Word is life, and in the Word is the light of men. And that light, what is that light? The Word of God. That light shines in darkness and darkness cannot comprehend it oh hallelujah if you studied it in different translations it says darkness can overpower it darkness can't do anything about it darkness can't defeat it the light the word of god is an overwhelming power that knocks darkness on its feet that destroys darkness that uh, literally expels darkness it casts darkness out everywhere you go so all that to say the cheapest way to get your deliverance today the cheapest way you can break free from some of these uh, attacks that the enemy have, may have, 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 have launched your direction is simply by hearing God's truth. And when you receive it and believe it, it's a light that goes to war against the darkness. That's why it's nothing that you have to do in yourself. It's not like you have to you know, pick up a sword and fight an actual devil. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against unseen forces. And the way we deal with those unseen forces is by the sword of the spirit, the word of God. The sword of the spirit literally acts as a weapon to, to, to strike down every chain, every op opposing force that's been launched to screw things up in your life. You are meant to scrape the bottom of the barrel. You were meant to be constantly struggling throughout life. You were, that's what religion teaches. I mean, you know, serving God is hard. Actually, serving the devil was hard because it was when I was serving the devil that I had OCD and depression and anxiety and were taking medications and I had no hope and I was without God in this world. It was when I served the devil that I had suicidal thoughts. It was when I served the devil that I had no hope for living. It was when I served the devil that things went downward fast 
fast, like a downward spiral. But when I joined hands with Jesus, that's when I entered into the path of blessing. That's when I entered into a path of healing, a path of restoration, a path of prosperity, a path of victory and triumph. The Bible says, now thanks be unto God who gives you power to just endure. No, who gives you power to triumph in all things in life. And I see you entering into that path today. Whether the devil likes it or not, as the truth of God's word gets into your spirit, everything darkness has set up in your life, every demonic onslaught against you and your family, it is being dissolved now in the name of Jesus Christ. If you believe that for your family and for yourself, I want you to type amen in the chat as a sign of faith that you're receiving from God today. Hallelujah. So let's go through the last 10, and I'm going to shoot through these. The last 10 lies. I went through 1 through 5 on Tuesday. We're going to go through 6 through 15 right now. Lies the devil wants you to believe, and in getting you to adopt these belief systems, he'll literally get, he doesn't even have to do anything. The devil, I said it before, he doesn't have power to actually make you sick. He just has to get you to believe that you have to be sick and you, sickness is just another part of life. He doesn't have, he doesn't have power to actually uh, uh, um, uh, keep you bound. He just has to get you to believe that you're cursed. He just has to get you to believe that you're unlucky or that God's just working some mysterious plan in all this, that, that depression. First of all, how is God working a mysterious plan through your depression if the very Bible says in his presence is fullness of joy? It doesn't make sense. One of the, either God in his Bible is lies and full of lies, or that preacher that sold you that lie, and he might have been sincere in telling you that. A lot of preachers, because they don't take the time to fast and pray and actually secure God's power to set a generation free, they have to come up with all kinds of nonsense. They have to tell people it's just another part of life. They have to tell people, you know, sometimes this is just how God works. They have to tell people something because people are coming to them and they want answers. And so they have to give him some answer, but notice how none of those answers are backed by scripture. And they always say, you know, and the devil loves this excuse. Well, how many of you know Job went through hell and back and God allowed it? Yeah, God allowed it and he tells you why he allowed it. Job 3 says, Job 3.22, the thing which I have feared has come on me and that which I have dreaded has come to me. Job wasn't operating in faith at that time. He was scared that all these things would happen and fear is a magnet for trial. But when you operate in faith, the Bible says, whatever, whatever is born of God has overcome the world, and this is the victory, even our faith. So let's get in it. Number six line, the Bible is not inspired. The devil wants you to believe that the, de that the Bible is just another book. It's just a book amongst book, a, a religious textbook that should collect dust with all the other college textbooks that you have. And there's a growing demographic in Christian circles that are challenging the inspiration and inerrancy of the Holy Scriptures. Many believe that it's partial. You know, there's even liberal theologians, people that started out well, but now they're adopting because they couldn't make sense of certain things in life. So they say that it's partially depressed, uh, partially, dep partially inspired, that it's partially uh, uh, truth, but there's room for error because it was written by men. Let me read something to you. 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, and beginning with verse 16. Peter says, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables. We weren't following fairy tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were very eyewitnesses of his majesty. For we, he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Verse 19. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines. There it goes again. The word is compared to a light that shines in a dark place. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, this is what I was getting at. Pay special attention. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy, the word of God, never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So the Bible says that Peter didn't just come up with a good idea, and he said, you know what? This is, 
this is a great idea for a book. I'm going to write this. It's not how it happened. Isaiah, in prophesying, didn't just wake up one morning and uh, he just started, you know, randomly telling a fictional tale that ended up being believed as truth and people bought it, even though he, you know, he was always, he was very open. It's all fiction, but I mean, I, it just happened to, to be that all these things came true. I don't know what to say. That's not how the Bible was moved. The Bible says that holy men of God were moved. They were literally thrusted. There, there was a, a compelling force that got them to write these words down. And the, every single word is inspired. Not just the thought was inspired. The very words the authors used have the divine imprint on listen to this the way this is how we know that all scripture is inspired not, not just the idea the very words the very you know every greek word every dot and tittle jesus says he says until heaven and earth pass away not one dot or tittle meaning even the commas even the exclamation points everything was divinely set in order by god and this is what 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is given by inspiration and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete. Get this, this is important as to why I'm talking about this, this very lie the devil tries to pitch to our generation. So God's scriptures are given by inspiration so that the man of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work so why does the devil try to get people to adopt the lie that the scriptures are not inspired that it's just another book because then people can't be complete they can't enter into god's fullness and secondly they'll never be thoroughly equipped this is why this demonic doctrine is being uh it, it's being literally it's, it's making its advance on the church now with liberal theologians saying, you know, we don't believe in the inerrancy of scripture. We don't believe that it's infallible. Inerrancy just means uh, it, it, when something's inerrant, it's not prone to error. It's perfect and it's complete. When someone says we don't believe the inerrancy of scripture, they're saying that th the scripture is vulnerable to error scientifically, historically, and just spiritually, that some of its things could have been maligned or lost through translation through the time and all that. So the devil does that and gets people to accept this partial inspiration because then you're never going to, number one, you're not going to be fully, you're not going to be uh, complete. You're not going to walk in God's fullness. And number two, you'll never be thoroughly equipped for the work God's called you to do. I said it before, the word of God is the sword of the spirit and the word of God is the shield of faith that quenches every fiery dart of the devil. Well, if you don't have those two vital components of the armor of God, you're in a warfare at a great disadvantage and you'll never be able to accomplish the great things God has planned for you. You know, there's great men like uh, Truth Cathy with Chick-fil-A and J.C. Penney. These guys were, were, were Holy Ghost Christians when they were alive and the businesses God gave them and the work God inspire them to do literally was generated through supernatural creativity and wisdom derived from the word of God so had they not had their minds sharpened by God's word in accepting its truths they would have never been thoroughly equipped for the work God called them to now that's on a business level but let's even talk on a ministry level which is where the devil really seeks to paralyze the church if a Christian does not know God's word, they are not ev they're never going to be effective in bringing the gospel to people. Let me repeat that. If a Christian does not know God's word, they will be rendered ineffective in the sharing of their faith. Philemon chapter 1 in verse 6 says this. The sharing of your faith will become effective through the acknowledgement of every good thing that is in Christ Jesus. So when you study the word of God, you're seeing everything Jesus provided for us at the cross. And in doing so, you now are thoroughly equipped to share that message with others, to set other people free from the same bondages that Jesus set people free from in the Bible. So if you don't know Jesus heals, you're not going to be equipped to to tell people Jesus heals. And remember this, God, Jesus will be to people what you preach him to be. 
So if you never preach him as healer because you don't know from the word that he can heal, he'll never, he won't heal. He can only confirm his word. The Bible says that he confirms the words of his servants. He performs the counsel of his messengers. So if you don't preach him as healer, people won't get healed. That's why people that don't believe in heal never see anybody healed. They don't have testimonies like that. But then on the flip side, you have a guy like T.L. Osborne that preaches healing or preached healing, wrote a book, Healing the Sick, and he had more people healed in his ministry than any other ministry probably in history. That's If you don't preach Jesus as the burden bearer and the oppression crusher and deliver of the oppression of the devil, you're not going to see people deliver. That's why people that mock deliverance, that mock casting out demons, they don't see those things happen in their service. The devil can sit calmly and comfortably in their servants, not in their services, not even budged or disturbed by what they're preaching because the, the, the heat's not hot enough to actually cause them to manifest. That's why when Jesus came, the Bible says he came full of grace and full of truth. That's why demons couldn't stand his teaching. In the synagogue, he's preaching. And back in the day, they wouldn't just have one teacher come up. They had many teachers and preachers throughout the Sabbath day that would come up and share a word of exhortation. Well, that demonized man didn't move for one, two, three people that probably came up that day to read the scriptures and exhort the crowd. But then Jesus gets up full of grace and truth and the Bible says that that demonized person couldn't stand the heat and started to yell out what have we to do Jesus Christ son of the most high God have you come to destroy us before the time we beg you we implore you spare us and Jesus said shut up and come out what what was the difference Jesus was full of truth when he spoke the word of truth it caused demons to tremble the heat of the fire of God's word remember God's word is fire God's word is fire. The Bible says, is not his word like a fire shut up in my bones that I cannot, I cannot stay, but I grow weary and I have to speak it. Jeremiah, God told him my word will be like a fire in your mouth and like a hammer that breaks the mold to pieces. The Bible says that God himself is an all-consuming fire. And remember, we read in John 1 that the word and God are one. So if he's fire, then his word is fire. And so because God's word is fire, when you preach it, it literally generates an atmosphere, an environment that the devil cannot stand. And so he has to manifest. He has to come out. And so that's why the devil wants to keep people from believing that the scripture is fully inspired. Because if people, if, I mean, look at what Paul told Thessal the Thessalonian church. He said, I commend you, Thessalonians, because when you receive the word, you didn't receive it as the word of a man. You didn't receive it like you would a college textbook or some uh, fictional book or, you know, just a, a, a Time magazine article. You received it as what it really was. You saw the divine weight that was on my words and you received it as the word of God. And that's why, Paul said, it worked its power in you. So if you, if you adopt this lie that the scripture is, you know, semi-inspired or whatever, it will strip, it'll strip, it'll strip the word of God from all its power for you. Other people will benefit from it. Other people will be blessed by it. But you'll always be, you, you, you'll never benefit. You'll never, you'll never uh, generate its proofs in your life. Because before you can see God's word manifest tangibly around you. You have to first accept it in your heart and believe it with your spirit. And I'll tell you, just on a natural level, the indestructibility of the Bible attests to its divine nature. Only a very small percentage of books have survived past a quarter of a century. Even less make it past a century. Very small percentage. Not only has the Bible survived past a century, it's thousands of years later, and it's been kept intact. Not only has the Bible not been buried, because many have set out to bury the Bible, it still to this day remains the number one bestseller globally. Charles Spurgeon used to say, if it were possible to destroy the church, the church would have been destroyed by now. And I say the same for the word of God. If it were possible to destroy God's word and to obliterate it and exterminate it from the face of the earth, it would have been destroyed by now. I always tell this story. The Roman emperor Diocletian, he, uh, he saw Christian loyalty to the Bible as a threat to his kingdom. And so he set out in the year 303 to make a royal edict which was aimed and targeted 
to destroy the Bible and take it out of man's hands and burn every copy of the Bible publicly. And he actually believed he did that. He actually believed he accomplished that. And when he did, when he thought he had accomplished that, he, he made this like metal plaque, this steel plaque. And on it, he inscribed on it the words, the Christian religion is destroyed and the worship of the gods has been restored. And he set it in Rome as a big plaque for all to see and read. A few years later, Diocletian died. And Constantine, the new emperor of Rome, made Christianity the, the, the state religion along with the Bible as its most sacred text. Because while he was trying to do that, God preserved his word. There were many Christians that found places to hide their Bibles. They buried their Bibles. They did whatever they had to do to, main, to, to, to preserve the scripture. And not only did God knock that guy off the face of the earth, but a few years later, the new emperor then comes in and sets the, the, the main religion of Rome as Christianity and the sacred text of Rome being the Holy Scriptures. Neither kings nor monarchs nor church traditionalists and religious people have succeeded in exterminating the Bible. Matter of fact, the greater the attack on the Bible throughout history, the more it spread in the hands of the common man. I love this story. This, uh, listen to this. Peep this, as they say. Voltaire who was a famous French atheist philosopher, said within 100 years, the Bible would be a, 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 an extinct script, uh, an extinct uh, literature, that nobody would have a Bible in their hands, that if anything, it would be in some museums across the world, but that it would be an antiquated book, an irrelevant book, and no longer in high demand as it is this day. Well, today, Voltaire is dead, and this is why I love God a lot. His humor. I love the humor of God. Not only did it, is Voltaire dead and buried, but the very location of the home that Voltaire penned those words on, uh, in, where he, where he wrote the book where he was discussing this, not only is Voltaire dead and gone, but his very home that he lived in is now the Bible publishing house for uh, a huge part of Europe. So where one man stood and wrote, the Bible will no longer exist 100 years from now, that same location is being used as a distribution center for Bibles throughout Europe. The indestructibility of the Bible is a sure tell that the scriptures are inspired and divine. Num line number seven. I, you've, this is line number seven. You've made too many mistakes for God, the, the devil says, for God to love you or ever use you. You're unforgivable, and God has abandoned you and left you. The devil uses this lie to keep people in the pit of condemnation. And in doing so, he paralyzes people from ever stepping out and doing anything great for God. He gets people to believe you're, you're unforgivable. You have to bear the burden of the debt of sin that you owe to God. Understand this. If you have debt, financial debt, let's say you have a million dollars of debt for one reason or another, or another, and you adopt this belief system that you'll never break free from that debt, you know what's going to end up happening? Most likely, you're going to continue to accumulate debt. You're not going to work because you believe it's impossible to be forgiven of this debt or alleviated of this debt. You're going you're gonna to continue to accumulate the debt and you're not going to have actionable plan to rid yourself of this debt because it's such a high mountain. You know, why, why do not more people climb Mount Everest? Because they take one look at it and they say, I'm, there's no way I can do that. They look at it and they, they automatically believe there's, there's no way I have power to actually climb this mountain. So they never attempt to climb the mountain. The devil tries to get you to believe that there's a mountain of debt of sin in your life. And I'm talking about people that have repented of sin and you've, you've asked God for forgiveness and you're living a holy life, but there's constant thoughts of condemnation, constant uh, remembrance of all the mistakes of your past. And then there's this, this sorrow, this not godly sorrow that leads to repentance. It's a worldly sorrow that gets you to be fixed and focused 
on all the things you've did and how God can never forgive you and you just soak in this, this miry clay of condemnation as a result. And when you do that, you feel buried in it, inescapable. So if a guy had a million dollar debt and he believes it's, there's no way I'm ever going to get bail out of this debt, he's going to continue accumulating the debt, the debt. That's why the devil wants to get people to feel the burden of sin and feel the, the, uh, the, the condemnation of sin. Because if, if, I'm talking about the church here, people that are forgiven, yet they're still burdened down, weighed by the sins and guilt of their past. Because if the devil successfully weighs you down by the guilt of your past, you're, 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 you're going to have this lax attitude towards sin. Just like the man who's in insurmountable debt, he's going to be okay with accumulating another 5,000. What's another 5,000 of debt? What's another 10,000 of debt? But when there, when someone's, for, let's say they had a million dollars of debt and they're forgiven of a million dollars of debt, supernaturally, the bank calls and says, you don't have to pay it. What do you think is going to happen to that person? They're never going to want to get in debt another day in their life. They're going to be sure that they keep a firm watch on their life and they say, I'm, I don't even care if it's $50. I'm, not, I'm burning all my credit cards. I'm burning. I am not getting, like Dave Ramsey approach, I'm never going to enter into another dime of debt from this day onward. When Christians adopt the mentality that they still have to bear the burden of their sin and they're weighed down by guilt and condemnation of their past, they're more likely to keep on sinning and accumulate the debt. But when you realize that you've been forgiven, that you've been cleansed of all unrighteousness, that there's therefore no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, that the Lord, the Bible says, has taken out the handwriting of debt, the certificate of debt, the debt of sin that we owe to God. Jesus took it out of the way. He nailed it to the cross. When you realize that, there'll be a resistance in your spirit towards sin. You're not going to sin. You're not going to have that attitude towards sin anymore. Oh, that's another thing. I'm already burdened. No. You'll have an, a violent reaction against temptation. I know where sin brought me into. The pit that God delivered me from. And I refuse to ever go back. That's why Paul pens those words in Galatians 5.1. He says, it was for freedom that Christ set you free. Therefore, no longer be subject again to a yoke of bondage. How do you subject? God doesn't subject you to bondage. The devil doesn't even have power to subject you to bondage. It's when you fall victim to sin that you literally take the very yoke that, the, that God delivered you from. You take it and you put it right back on your neck and you clip it back in and you fasten its bolts. And you say, I'm back in it again. That's what sin does. So the devil tries to get people to feel like they've made too many mistakes. They're too far from God. God will never forgive you. I'm here to tell you, my brother and sister, that Christ has absolved you of all debt. The Bible says he took upon himself all the sins of this world. The wages of sin is death. That's why Jesus had to die. But because he died and rose again, the free gift of God is life eternal by Christ Jesus. The only unforgivable sin there is, is when you blaspheme the Holy Spirit. What is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? There's a lot of people that say, I don't know if I've blasphemed the Holy Spirit. What if I've blasphemed the Holy Spirit? First of all, if you're questioning whether you blaspheme the Holy Spirit and you're afraid of it and you're living a life trying to please God as much as you can, then you haven't blasphemed the Holy Spirit. Someone who blasphemed the Holy Spirit, this is what it looks like. When you deliberately, intentionally mock and attribute the work of God to the devil. You're mocking speaking in tongues. You're mocking miracles of God. You're mocking evangelism and people that are set out to do evangelism. In this militant fashion, you take on a military approach to mocking the things of God. You're mocking God himself. And you've turned your back on the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And you continue to do so. Refusing to turn. The Bible says, he that hardens his neck, after many corrections, he will, his neck will be broken without remedy. When someone is deliberately in a militant fashion, Turn from God, mocking God, attributing the work of God and the work of the Holy Spirit to the devil without any desire to repent or turn. 
That's what the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. That's the only thing that God says is unforgivable. But the very fact you tune into this broadcast and you're listening to me preach, and if you're a viewer of this broadcast, you've, talk, you've heard me talk about healing, you've heard me talk about miracles and signs and wonders, and those things intrigue you, that shows you you haven't committed the impardonable sin. And if you haven't committed the impardonable sin, then guess what? There's nothing you've done. There's no, nowhere you've been. There's nothing you've said that Jesus' blood will not clean you and cleanse you from here and now. I... Take authority over every lying devil that has gotten you to believe that God's abandoned you, that he's taken his Holy Spirit from you, that he's left you, that he's forsaken you because of something you've done, maybe an abortion in your past, maybe you've even committed murder. I'm here to tell you it doesn't matter. Paul was a brutal murderer of the church of Christ on the earth. He persecuted the church. He brought people bound to Jerusalem to stone them and kill them. And yet this Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God now. Because after Jesus cleansed him, he didn't just take the sin away. He removed the guilt of his past. And he said, I am what I am by the grace of God. Grace is not just God covering. It's not God covering your sin. It's him removing the guilt of your sin, the nature of sin, the desire to sin. And he empowers you then to go and sin no more. And listen to this. Paul writes in another letter. And this is the same Paul that beat people, that consented to the death of the first martyr, Stephen, in Acts chapter 7. This Paul's writing later on in life, after he's been saved, years later, he says, I have wronged nobody. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is, I feel the Holy Ghost on this so strong. God is restoring the innocence of your heart, the purity of your heart. Just like David prayed, Lord, create in me a pure heart. God is regenerating in you a pure heart a heart that's free of the condemnation of your past in Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus. God will never leave you and forsake you. God is with you to the ends of the ages, the Bible says. The Bible says, be strong and courageous. I'll never leave you. Why do you think the devil wants you to believe that God's left you? Because if you believe God's left you, then you'll never be strong and courageous because the very knowledge and the awareness of God's presence is a generator of confidence in life. If you don't know God's with you, you won't be confident. The Bible says there are three things that are majestic and bold in pace. Yes, there are four which are stately in wonder. A lion which is greatest amongst beasts, and he turns not away from any. And then I love what the Bible says in Proverbs 30, verse 31. A king whose troops are with him. When a king walks alone through the streets, he might have insecurity and fear. When a king walks with his posse and his entourage of troops, he walks differently. He walks like royalty. He knows nobody can come up and impede on him. He knows nobody can bully him. He knows nobody can harass him. When you're not assured that God's presence goes with you everywhere you are, you'll be insecure. You'll walk in timidity. You'll walk in fear. You'll be tormented. The devil will come in and do whatever he wants because you'll walk with a, a disposition that literally welcomes the devil for a attack but when you understand that God is with you and for you and not against you it'll cause you to walk differently it'll cause you to look different there'll be a flame in your eye you'll finally walk like the lion that God's made you to be and you'll turn not away from any lie number seven you're unforgivable and God has left you can a woman forget her nursing child, the Bible says, and not have compassion on the son of her womb surely they might forget but God said I'll never forget you some of you come from broken homes. Some of you come from a home where your, your, your mother left you. Your father left you. They, they, they just put you in adoption. Or maybe they didn't even put you in adoption. They just left you at a grocery store. Hope someone would pick you up. They didn't want anything to do with you. Your, your father was a drunk or whatever. The Bible says, can a, a woman forget her nursing child? Even if it can happen. Even if it can happen. I'll never forget you. The Bible says in Psalm 27, 10, when my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will take care of me. God's going to take good care of you. You might feel like an orphan in life, but you're not an orphan in God's sight because the Bible says that he's your father. What great love the father has bestowed on us in Christ that we should be called children of God. The Bible says I've inscribed you on the palm of my hand and you are mine. When you walk through the rivers, it will not drown you. When you go through the waters, they will not overflow you. And though you walk through the fire, you'll not be burnt because of God's accompanying presence. Lie number eight, you don't have enough faith. And I'm going to skip through these ones, but the Bible 
uh, or the devil rather, tries to get people to believe that they don't have faith. The lie he uses here is aimed at getting people to feel like they don't have the capacity to believe God for the impossible. And remember, it is to you according to your faith. So if you can't believe it, then you will never see it. Because that's what the law of faith dictates. You have to believe it before you can see it. And so he gets people to confess, I don't have faith. Because if you don't believe you have faith, then you're never going to actually exercise your faith and turn it loose to receive. Faith is what sets the pace for your expectation. And expectation is the breeding ground for miracles. And so if there's no faith, because you don't think you have any, it's like a farmer. He can have a full barn full of seed. But if he stands outside in his field and he says, I don't have seed because he's been wrongly deceived into thinking he doesn't have seed, even though there's a bunch of seed in the barn, he will never sow seed to reap a harvest. In the same vein, the Bible says in Romans 12, 3, God has distributed to us a measure of faith. If you say you don't have faith, then you're going to hell because the Bible says... It's by grace through faith that we're saved. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, it's with the heart man believes and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You have to believe and confess if you're going to be saved. So if you say, I don't have faith, then you don't believe you're even saved. The very fact you know you're saved shows that you have faith. The problem here is that people don't realize that the same faith you use to receive salvation, the same faith that you have to release to receive God's salvation for your life and forgiveness for your sins is the same exact faith. It's not a different faith. It's the same seed of faith that you can use to receive every other thing in life. It's the seed of faith that you have to sow in the ground and expectation will breed it for miracles. So if the devil can get someone to feel like they don't have the faith that it takes to lay hold, then they'll never engage in the fight of faith. Think of it this way. I just saw an Instagram video yesterday, actually, right before I started preparing for the broadcast, and I loved it. It it just gave me such a clear picture of what I'm saying right now. There was this Instagram video, and it was a real, real real-life boxing match. And there was these two guys, heavyweights in the ring. One was much heavier of a weight than the other one. And he, he looked mean. And he knew, you know, he had the eye. They used to say Mike Tyson would destroy people before he even stepped in the ring because his eyes, he, he would look at you with a death stare. And just that stare would get people to like poo their pants. So this heavyweight, you know, massive boxer gets in the ring. Then the other one who's also a heavyweight. If that heavyweight had contend or competed in a lesser weight, he would have been, he would have been you know, the much bigger uh, opponent. But because this guy was like way out of his league, this heavyweight comes in and he just, you can tell, he doesn't even look at him in the eye. He walks in the ring, he, he, they do the, the, the fist bump, and he literally, the moment the bell, the bell rings to signal the beginning of the fight, he turns around and walks out the ring and just walks back to the locker room. Because in boxing, as long as you show up, if you enter into the room, into into the ring there's actually a financial compensation for that so he just did it to make whatever money he can make and then he got out he knew there's no way in heaven earth or hell that i'm gonna take a punch from that guy he's gonna crack my skull open this is how christians operate because they don't believe they have faith they see an impossible situation ahead of them and because the devil gets them to wrongly believe that they don't have the faith to actually fight, they don't ever fight the fight of faith. And because they don't fight the fight of faith, they can never lay hold on the victory of faith and so they succumb to defeat without ever even fighting, without ever even trying. They don't even try. The Bible says God has given to each one. I want you to write that in the comment section right now. I want you to make a bold confession today. I have faith. I want you to write, actually write this, I have great faith. I have great faith. The issue is not that you don't have faith, it's that you have to learn how to release your faith. How do you release your faith? Two ways, by your words and by your actions. The Bible says that centurion man, he told Jesus, just speak the word and I know my servant will be made well. The centurion man understood that law of faith, that if I'll speak, if Jesus will just speak the word, I know his word carries authority to subdue every one of my enemies. So just speak the word. You don't even have to come lay hands on them. That's what faith, faith speaks. The Bible says we have in the same spirit of faith, even as they did, we believe, therefore we speak. Faith is expressed through your words. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You can't say you have faith if you're not speaking faith words. 
Joshua and Caleb saw the same promised land and the same giants and the same opposition. But they said, if God's for us, we can by all means take possession. They spoke it and they're the only ones that entered into the promised land. Isaiah 45, 11 says, concerning the work of my hands, ye command me. God says, command me. Imagine that. This is Isaiah 45, 11. Command me concerning the work of my hands. Well, what's the work of his hands? You read the Bible. You see what God's, the work of God's hands are. You see his healing. You see his, his, his deliverance. You see everything God has done. And the Bible, God actually challenges you saying, if you'll have faith to speak it, I'll take it as a command to go and do it. It's not that we're arrogantly commanding God to do anything. It's just that when you speak God's word, he said, I've honored my word above my own name. And God takes it as a personal, a personal responsibility then to enforce the delivery of what you've spoken. How do you release you? It's not that I have no faith. It's just I have never learned how to release my faith effectively. And it's not I tried speaking it once. It didn't work. And so I don't believe in that. Moses, let my people go, he told Pharaoh. He kept on coming. He didn't have, it didn't work first time he went in. It's not like Pharaoh said, okay, let's let the people go, Moses. He had such authority. No, he kept on speaking until he started seeing. You don't stop declaring until you start seeing the manifestation. And even when you start seeing the manifestation of it, you keep on speaking it until you see the fullness of what God promised you. Keep speaking, my children will serve the Lord. Keep speaking, my body shall be healed. Keep speaking, my kidneys are coming back to life. My liver is coming back to life. My lungs are fully functional. Keep speaking, I will, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And don't stop declaring until you start, until you see the, manif the full manifestation of what God's promise. That's what Elijah said. Do you see rain? The servant came back, I don't see any rain. He didn't quit there, well, it must not be rain. Keep, go back and check again. Whenever someone says, you know, you've been speaking that for so long. Where is the manifestation? Just tell them, check again, check again, check again. Keep going, keep checking until you start seeing. The servant came back, there's nothing. Check again. Then finally, the seventh time he said, there's, I mean, there's a, there's a cloud of the size of a small hand that's coming from the sea, but that's not, a, that's not the, 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 the storm that you've been praying for. See, that's where people stop, stop saying, you know, we, we had some victory, but we didn't see everything God promised us. And so we just, you know, Elijah said, go. I hear the sound of, a, of a, a, a torrential downpour. I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. Elijah didn't stop. Even, he didn't get discouraged by the small cloud that was rising from the sea. He saw the cloud as a, as a proof that what he was doing was working. And so the proof shouldn't get you to back down. The proof should get you to keep on going because what you're doing is working. The devil's backing off. You're resisting him. And it's only a matter of time before he flees. And God's abundant rain of Blessing comes on you. Number one, words. And then number two, you release your faith through actions. James 1 says, Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. He who looks into the perfect law of liberty, the word of God, and continues therein, and is not a forgetful hearer of the word, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. The blessing is in doing the work. Not just hearing and confessing alone. We gotta do the work. Name and dip in the river Jordan. I don't wanna do that. That's, that river's dirty. All right, then don't get healed. It was when he went to dip that the healing manifested. Number nine, lie number nine, the devil uses. The gospel doesn't set you free from sin, the devil says. It just provides forgiveness for when you do sin, inevitably. You still sin every day and don't ever, ex don't ever expect otherwise. If you accept this lie, you'll never have the power to break free from sin. I've said this before, what you believe is what you'll become. The devil wants get, to get Christians to believe they're still sinners and they still sin every day. And that just sets the pace for a life of continual sin. Instead, confess what God's word says about you. The sin no longer has dominion over you that you should obey. You don't have to sin every day. You can stop sinning. Your attitude towards sin will determine whether you're a slave to sin or whether, slaves a sli a, or whether sin is a slave to you. I'm going to repeat that. Your attitude towards sin will determine whether you're its slave or it's your slave. Whether sin has dominion over you or you have dominion over sin. If you have this lax attitude, we all sin every day. How many of you know we're all sinners? Speak for yourself. I've been saved. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus now because of what Jesus did for me. Not by works of righteousness, by his grace alone. And so I'm going to say what the Bible says about me. I'm going to get in agreement. Well, that's what faith is. I'm agreeing with God. 
You have a lot of preachers that say things, but they don't agree with God's word. I choose to agree with God's word. I mean, no, 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 we're all sinners. We sin every day. Actually, God's word says that sin no longer has dominion over me, that sin no longer reigns in my mortal body, that I shall obey its lust. The Bible literally says that uh, sin no longer has influence over me. The Bible says the Holy Spirit was sent so that I can have victory over this very thing. And so I agree with God. You don't have to sin. You can break free from sin. Lie number 10. You can't expect to live like Jesus lived. He's the son of God. The devil uses this lie to get people out of the realm of the supernatural and back into the natural realm where he can operate unhindered. You're, you know, you can't expect to live like Jesus. That was Jesus. You can't expect to heal the sick. can't expect to cast out devils. Jesus said in John 14, 12, these works that you've seen me do, they that believe on me, you will do greater. You'll do the same works you've seen me do, and you'll do greater works because I'm going to the Father. Jesus is not a museum to look at and marvel and say, whoa, well, that was Jesus. Jesus came to set an example for us. That's why the Bible says constantly admonishing the reader, be imitators of Christ, be imitators of God. Do what Jesus did. The Gospels is a blueprint as to how we're to operate in life. Everything about our life is to be supernatural. Everything. Finances, supernatural flow. Physical, strength, supernatural flow. Peace and joy in the home, supernatural flow. I'm not to say there won't be challenges in life, but whenever a challenge comes, that supernatural flow of God's power enables you to have victory in challenges and to always operate at a high level and never be drawn down Never be dragged down to a low level in life. The Bible says, Isaiah 8, 18, I and the children whom the Lord has given to me, we were created for signs and wonders. I want you to write that in the comment section. I was created for signs and wonder. wonders. I was created for signs and wonders. Bible says when the Lord brought the captives back from back to Zion, meaning when he redeemed sinners, when he brought you out of your past and into his kingdom, we were like them that dream. Your life should look like a dream for others. Your life should get other people to scratch their head and says, that's not normal. Your life should get people to back up and say, teach me your secret. The Bible says in Psalm 126, even the heathen said of them, what great things God has said, has, has done for them. Your life should literally be a, a proof after proof of the existence of God. That people that are the most staunch atheists look at you and say, you're an enigma. You, you fly in the face of everything I believe. I can't rationalize what I'm seeing with my logical mind. That's what, that's what drew people into the early church. The Bible says in mighty signs and wonders. That's right, Lisa. It's a higher life. In mighty signs and wonders, the disciples gave witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In mighty signs and wonders, the Bible says that God worked signs and wonders through them as they spoke the word boldly and unashamedly. Acts chapter 3, they lift that man that was a paralyzed beggar at the gate called Beautiful. And what did it do? It drew people in. And they, they marvel at what had happened. The supernatural lifestyle of a believer is one of the greatest tools of evangelism that's available and accessible to the believer. Mark 16, 15 through 17, Jesus says, these signs will follow. Nothing about your life should be boring. Nothing about your life should be mundane. The Bible says, these signs and wonders will follow them who believe. In my name, they'll cast out devils. In my name, they'll lay hands on the sick, and the sick shall recover. Your life should be the product of supernatural flow of God's power that produces supernatural signs in the area of your finances, in the area of your health, in the area of your strength, in every area of your life where the heathen looks and says, what great things God has done for you. Even the most staunch atheist has to back up and reevaluate his belief system because he knows that what's being done is not naturally possible. That's why Jesus gave us his name to use. You know, when Jesus gave you his name to use, he gave you full power of attorney 
to use his name. Do you know what full power of attorney means? I looked it up. Power of attorney is a legal authorization that gives a designated person, which in this case is you and I, termed the agent or attorney in fact, which is you and I, the power to act for another person known as the principal. Who's the other person? Jesus. When he said, use my name, he's saying, when you go and use my name, when you give a command in my name, I'm giving you the power to act as though I was saying the, the command, as though I were releasing the command, as though I was standing there in your stead. It's that you are my representative. And when you use my name, it's as though the command you gave was sent forth straight from me, from heaven itself. You want to be Christ-like? Don't just be Christ-like in character, which is important and extremely important. But move on even in being Christ-like in power. You know, the very word Christians literally means little Christs. Because they saw them and they said, hey, hey, we saw big Christ. He did signs and wonders. And now these guys are coming out and they're doing signs and wonders. So they said, these must be little Christs. These must be followers. These must be attached to the same flow of power Christ was. Number 11, lie. So number 10 was you know, that was Jesus. Can't expect to live like him. No, you can because everything Jesus did, he did by the gifts of the Spirit and by the anointing of the Spirit. Yes, he was the Son of God. Yes, he, he manifested his glory as the Son of God. But everything he did was by the power of the Holy Spirit. He even told Philip, the works you see me do is not I. It's the Father, the Spirit of God in me doing the works. And he said, I'm sending you the Holy Spirit so you can continue the works. Jesus didn't leave to stop the work. He left and then gave the Holy Ghost for us to continue the work. Lie number 11, God is absolutely sovereign. And because of that, nothing you do can change the outcome of your life or of your situation. The devil uses this lie to get people to back down from personal responsibility. There's nothing you can do that's going to change the outcome of what you're facing right now. God's sovereign. What you're experiencing is by his sovereignty. Whether he wants you to come out or not, we have to just trust in his sovereign, sovereignty. God doesn't sovereignly send people to hell. Why do people go there? God already said, I desire none to, be, to perish, all to be saved. Why do people go there? Because just because God is sovereign, let me explain it this way. In God's sovereignty, he has allotted man the free will to choose to believe him or reject him. That's why Joshua said, choose ye this day whom you should serve. God, which leads to blessing in life, or the devil, that leads to curses, curses and, and strivings throughout in your entire life. Oh, that you would choose life that you and your descendants may live. So God doesn't sovereignly send people to hell. God doesn't sovereignly make people sick. And in a big one, you know, people say, you know, like I talked about, God, the devil tries to get people to believe that God isn't, is, his sovereignty means that we can't change anything and including the state of a nation. And then they use that whole thing, you know, the Bible says in the last days, society is going to get worse. Yeah, it does. But you can still be used by God to change the course of a city and a nation because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God doesn't sovereignly send revival to cities. God, we just pray that you'd have a sovereign move in this city. God uses people to bring revival. That's always been his, that's always been his uh, MO, method of operation. He sent Philip to bring revival to Samaria. And there was great joy in the city. He sent, he sent Philip to the Ethiopian eunuch to bring revival to the Ethiopian eunuch's life. Why? If God just moved sovereignly, why didn't the Ethiopian eunuch just somehow, you know, get saved randomly just by reading the Bible? That was it. No, he sent Philip to him to explain what he was reading in the Bible. He sent Philip to Samaria to preach Christ to the people. The gospel is no gospel at all until it's preached. Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach. Why didn't he just say, hey, I've done everything. It is finished. I've done everything there, there is to, to do. Now, relax, guys. Go and get a nice job. Work on your own dreams. It's nothing you can do to change my will now. No. Go into all the world. I've got a will and a desire to save people and shake cities and bring revival to nations. But you need to go. God doesn't sit with sitters. He goes with goers. We are his fellow workers. The Bible says co-laborers with God. God sent Peter to Cornelius' house to do what? To preach the gospel to him. Why didn't he just get the angel to preach the gospel to Cornelius? 
Because God has a, a, an MO. He, 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 told, he sent the angel to tell Cornelius to fetch for Peter. And when Peter came, it was through Peter's preaching that he got saved. The reason why the devil wants to get you to believe everything's just sovereign and all that. You know, if you're sick, it's sovereign. It's God's sovereignty. If you're poor, it's God's sovereignty. If, if, uh, if you're in bondage, it's God's sovereignty. Whatever. If your nation's in like this, it's God's sovereignty. He does that to get you to accept everything that comes your way. You'll, you'll just accept everything the devil throws your way and you'll just say it's God's sovereignty. Because like, if you think it's God doing it, who can fight God and, and win? What case do you plan, what, what court do you plan on bringing your case to? He's the judge of all the earth. You're then rendered helpless. You're just going to accept your lot in life. This is the, this is the, 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 the card that, I, that was dished out to me. A set of cards that was dished out to me. I just make, I, I got a lemon and you know, I just make do with it and make lemonade. All those deflated statements, deflated people make. And it's because they bought this lie that whatever happens in life, it's for a reason. No, sometimes the reason is that there's a real devil that prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I'm here, I want to make this very clear to you. Satan is the author of sickness. Jesus is the author of healing. Satan brings destruction. Jesus brings restoration. Satan brings captivity and oppression. Jesus brings freedom and liberty. Satan is the one that brings into bondage. Jesus is the, the one who brings into liberty. Satan's the one that makes poor. Jesus is the one that makes rich. And don't get those two confused. Lie number 12. Let me skip through these next three very quickly. Lie number 12. And I've almost covered this in another point, so I'll go through it even quicker. Yes, it's sin, but God knows your heart. Devil gets people to think, yeah, I know it's sin, but, but God, God knows my heart. He sees, he sees my heart. Any doctrine that seeks to make you comfortable in sin is a doctrine birthed in hell and must be rejected with spiritual violence. With spiritual violence. The whole, you know, I know what I'm doing is wrong, but God knows my heart, is literally... Uh, an insult to the gospel because the Bible says that from within the heart proceeds adultery, fornication, lust, evil thoughts, murder, anger. So Jesus actually said, what's in your heart is going to actually show forth in what you say and how you act. So the whole, I know how I'm acting, but God knows my heart is hypocrisy because Jesus himself said, it's the very fact someone is committing adultery or is doing evil is because from within the heart, those things proceed. So you can't say, I know what I'm doing is wrong, but my heart is right. What you're doing is reflective on what's in your heart. It's reflective on what's in your heart. So what do you do? Jesus said, uh, Ezekiel says in Ezekiel 36, he takes out the heart of stone and he puts a new heart in you. A heart to do God's will. You could, whenever someone says, I know my whole life is literally designed by sin and there's nothing I'm doing right, but God knows my heart. That person's not saved. That person is not, their name is not written in the Lamb's book of life. Because Jesus said that you are known by your fruit. You shall know them by their fruit. Now you'll know them by what they say. You'll know them by the fruit that they produce. John 3 says, this is the judgment that came into the world. God, God in this dispensation of grace is not judging anyone. He's not condemning anyone. Jesus wasn't sent to condemn the world, but that the world through Christ would be saved from the wrath to come. But the judgment on judgment day that's going to come to unrepented sinners is this. John 3 says it. They love darkness more than light because their deeds were evil. That's, what, that's, the, that's going to be the judgment that's going to come to, to people. They love darkness. They loved evil. They loved the deeds of the flesh. They loved their fleshly lusts lust too much. They, they refuse to relinquish it. 
And they proved it because their deeds were evil. That's the judgment that's coming into the world. So you can't say, I know it's sin, but God knows my heart. Your very actions are reflective of what's in your heart. Line number 13, it can't be done, the devil says. It's impossible. Never call anything impossible. I want you to say that out loud wherever you're at. I'll never call anything impossible again. All things are possible to him that believes, the Bible says. Mary gets a word from the angel. Hey, you're going to have a baby, but you're never going to sleep with a man. Well, how can that be? The power of the Most High is going to overshadow you, and that which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. All right, let it be done. She didn't say, well, that's impossible. Hey, angel, have you ever read a biology textbook? Hey, angel, you ever studied, uh, you ever studied biology? That doesn't work that way. That's not what she replied. She said, let it be done to me exactly as you've said. And that's exactly what happened. And the angel said, blessed is she that believe there shall be a performance of those things that were spoken to her by the Lord. Never call anything impossible. Hannah heard the prophet's word. She had tried many years to get pregnant. Nothing happened. The prophet comes down and says, by this time next year, you'll have a child. What did, what did she say? You know, I've tried all that. I've done everything. You know, I'm doing uh, IF treatments. I, I've done everything. I, I, I'm going to every doctor, every specialist. And this preacher's just trying to get my hopes up. No, she accepted the word of God and sh she immediately got up, wiped away her tears, and she ate again. She, she wasn't eating, not because she was fasting. She wasn't eating because she had no appetite because of the sorrow of heart that she was feeling. But the moment she got the word from God, she got up and ate. Because although nothing changed, she hadn't even had intimacy with her husband yet. But nothing changed yet. But she knew and that she knew in her heart that God can do the impossible. Nothing's too difficult for God. The Bible says all things are possible to him that believes. The scripture says, God made the heavens and the earth by his great power and outstretched arm. And there's nothing too hard for the Lord. Stop calling things hard. Stop calling things difficult. Stop calling things challenging. Start calling things, or start saying things rather, like Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. If God is for me, then there's nothing impossible that's ahead of me. He makes the mute to sing, the blind to see, the deaf to hear. Then I know that whatever I'm, I'm facing right now, it, it, not only is it possible, it's easy with God. If he can part a Red Sea, an entire body of water, then he can open up the doors that I need opened. devil couples this lie with saying, telling people your situation's hopeless. No, no, bother, no, no point bothering God about it. That's what they did with Jairus. Jesus is on his way to Jairus' house and men came from Jairus' house saying, don't bother the teacher anymore. Your daughter is dead. Give up. Your situation's hopeless. It went from difficult to impossible. You know what Jesus said to Jairus? Hey, don't be afraid. Only believe all things are possible to him that believes. And he went to Jairus' house. He kicked out all the doubters and naysayers. He went into the room, grabbed her, and he said, Talitha kumai, little girl, I say to you, arise. And because he had dominion over death, the little girl had breath come back into her life, and she, she rose up. If Jairus had said, you know, Jesus, I wish you had come sooner. Oh, I guess we just don't, we can't make sense of why things happen in life. We just got, Jesus' will was to heal that girl and raise her up from that sickbed. The, the, the report of doubt and unbelief came. The devil tried to get him hopeless because if you're hopeless, you're helpless. But Jesus countered the report of unbelief by an infusion of faith. Hey, don't be afraid. Only believe. Your tomorrow's going to be all right because I'm with you here today. It ain't over till I say it's over. And it won't, and, and it won't be over until I... It, it ain't over till I say it's over. And God won't say it's over until you win. Devil wants, wants you to believe the anxiety you're feeling today will never go away. The depression you're feeling, there's no light at the end of the, tu the tunnel. The sickness you have, you'll have to cope with it the rest of your life. The child you, that's wayward will never return. The mountain you're facing will never be moved. The irreversible situation in your life will never be reversed. This is your lot in life. This is how it's been. This is how it'll always be. 
That anxiety you're feeling, you'll have to cope with it to the very end. And only when heaven comes, you'll be relieved. He you know, death's not your savior. You don't have to wait for death to be saved. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. So I'm here to tell you, right here and right now, anxiety, depression, mental illness, sickness, marital distress, whatever the devil's trying to do in your life, Don't be afraid. Only believe. And I see God reversing that irreversible situation. Number 14, lie. Nobody wants to hear the gospel. People will just mock me. You know, it's a hard world out there. The day, the day of tent evangelism and preaching the gospel in the streets is gone. That's exactly what the devil wants, so that he can strip the body of Christ of any desire to actually evangelize. Teal Osborne used to say, there are multitudes that would give their hearts to Christ if you just open your mouth and share Christ with them. But the devil tries to get people to back down by saying, they'll think you're crazy. They'll think you're a nut house. They'll think, they, they'll never believe. They'll never respond. Who, first of all, your job is not to get them to believe. Your job is just to preach the gospel by the anointing of the Spirit. And then it's their choice to believe or reject. But the devil gets people to back down from the Great Commission by getting them to focus on the response that they might face rather than our task of evangelism. You know, it's a cold world out there. People aren't quite as uh, responsive to the gospel as they used to be. And so we're, our job's just to pray. No, your job's to pray and preach. God gave you two legs. If all you had was one leg, you just go in circles. And that's how a lot of churches are. They just go in circles. God, we just pray you'd send revival to Montreal. We just ask you for, uh, for you to send your angels and bring them into, the, into these churches. That's not how God does things. You pray that God softens the hearts of the people, and then you preach. You pray and preach. You pray and preach. Jesus said, go. He didn't say stay and pray. He said pray and go into the highways and byways and compel them to come in. He gave you a green light. You don't have to pray, whether it be his will. Lord, if, if it's your will, I pray you just make it clear that I'm to evangelize to this. It's his will. If someone's in sin, it's his will to save them. This is why revival tarries. There's too many people that are writing books and talking about why revival tarries and they're not doing what's necessary to stop revival tearing and to usher in a revival. Revival follows the preaching of the gospel. That's how revival comes. There's no fancy mystical way to bring it in or usher it in. It's a simple thing. Revival follows the preaching of the gospel. There's a lot of preachers that have opinions on revival. Well, this is why I think revival is not happening. But don't follow a parked car, Reinhard Bonnke used to say. Don't follow a parked car. They're loud, they're blowing their horns and all that, but they're not moving. And that's why there's no fire. Don't follow a parked preacher talking about why revival's not here and people are hard and people are hard to reach, yet they don't have one evangelistic mission on the list and on the schedule for the year. That's why we don't sleep on the gospel. We take it up, the gospel call, freely we've received, and now we go out. That's why we do crusades in the inner cities of Canada and, and wherever else God would call us to do it. We do crusades. We open up our mouth. Jesus said what you hear in the, in the house, proclaim it on the rooftop. What you hear in secret, declare it on the mountaintop. Well, what will people think? What if they think I'm crazy? That's why Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I don't care if they think I'm crazy. I've seen what the world calls normal. I don't want to be normal. I've seen what the world calls dignified. I don't want to be dignified. I've seen what the world sees as normal. I want to be the opposite. Don't be shy. Teal Osborne used to say, when you're about to talk to someone about Christ, think of this. Listen to this. This is one of the greatest keys to successful evangelism. When you're about to preach the gospel to someone, 
You have to have and adopt this mentality about yourself. I have what the people want and the people want what I have. If you go in with a mindset that the people are going to call me crazy. Well, I, I don't know. What are people going to think about me? You're never going to have the boldness required in uh, delivering the gospel successfully. But if you'll go in with the understanding that God's rich power and resources are in me, and I can transmit that to others through the gospel, I have what the people want, and the people want what I have. You'll see such a, an improvement in your evangelistic efforts. You'll see people that are never interested, all of a sudden interested, because there's a, de a deliverance in your approach, and there's a, de a, a difference, sorry, in the approach and delivery of the gospel message through your mouth. Line number 15, and I finish with this, and this is a great place to finish off. There's no power in your words that you speak, and your words don't change anything. So just say whatever you want to say. James 3 says, your word is like the rudder of a ship, and the rudder of a ship is the part of the ship responsible for steering the boat. And Jesus, uh, James said, your mouth and your words are responsible for steering the ship of your life. And you can either use your words to navigate you out of troubled waters or use your words to navigate you in to further troubled waters. You can guide yourself out of turbulent waters through your word and your mouth or you can get yourself into deeper trouble through the words that you speak. Proverbs 12, 13, and 14. The wicked is ensnared by the transgression of his lips. Meaning because he doesn't keep a, a watch on his mouth, it just generates snares and traps all around him. But the righteous will come through trouble. The Bible says a man is satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth. A man will be satisfied with good, how? By the fruit of his mouth. So if the fruit of your mouth is rotten, you'll only be eating rotten fruit. Proverbs 13, 2 and 3, a man will eat well by the fruit of his mouth. So it's not a man will eat well because God's serving him a good meal that day. No, by the, God has a good meal prepared. The Bible says, I've prepared a table before you. God has a prepared meal for you. But what you speak matters. A man will eat well by the fruit of his mouth, and the soul of the unfaithful will feed on violence. Meaning the one who speaks unfaithful words, words void of faith, he'll feed on violence. He'll feed on, on uh, negative circumstances. He who guards his mouth, Proverbs 13, 3, will preserve his life. But he who opens wide his lips and says whatever he feels will have destruction. Here's a word for some of you today. Don't say whatever you feel. Generate a filtration system. Like David said, set a guard over my mouth and let a door be over the, over the set a guard over my, my mouth and let a door be over the over my lips. Don't just let whatever you feel come out of your mouth. Because the Bible says every idle word will be judged. And you'll be justified by your words or by your words you'll be condemned. You can literally be condemning yourself. You know, the Bible says no weapon formed against us can, uh, can prosper. And every word that's spoken against us, we shall condemn. You can literally be condemning yourself by the words you speak about yourself. Your self-talk matters. They came to John and says, what do you say about yourself? Well, I don't know. You know, I, I felt like I was a prophet, but, you know, nobody's really listening. He said, I am he. And he began to quote scripture, the voice of one in the wilderness saying, prepare the way of the Lord. He knew what the Bible said about himself. You'll never rise higher than your confession. And what's confession? It's agreeing with God. It's saying what God has said about you. The Bible goes at length to talk about the importance of your confession. Waver not from your confession of faith for he that promises faithful. Literally the whole scripture, the power of death and life is in your tongue. And they that love it shall eat of its fruit. The Bible says... And I read it before, a man will be satisfied with good by the confession of his mouth. The Bible, why would the Bible talk so much about confession if it wasn't important? You can just say what you want to say, it doesn't matter, it doesn't change anything. Because the devil wants you to back down in speaking faith words. Because if you just say whatever you see, and you just, I just, I'm a guy who calls it as he sees it. All right, well then that's what you'll see. You'll, what you're seeing is what you'll continue to see. You have to be like God who called those things which be not, which he didn't see as though they are. That's how faith operates. So in, you can use your words for destruction or you can use your words for building people up and building yourself up. You can either use your words to pull yourself down or you can use your words to build yourself up. 
James said, your word is like the rudder of a ship. You can either use it to go in circles in the Bermuda Triangle, or you can use it to navigate out of turbulent waters and into waters of peace. The Bible says he will guide you to a safe haven. Hallelujah. You can't, you can't, there's a lot of people who pray bold prayers, but then the moment they get out of the prayer closet, they immediately revert to a, a, an unbelief, a confession of unbelief, a negative report. You know, you pray for healing and you get around, you know, doctor says that uh, I'm going to have to deal with this. So, you know, I'm taking this medicate. What did you, did you not just pray to be healed? You're double-minded. And the Bible says he that's double-minded ought not to receive anything from the Lord. What you say, listen to this. What you say after you pray is just as much, what you say after you pray is just as important as what you're saying while you pray. The words you confess after you pray will either water the seeds you've sown in prayer or it will uproot the seeds that you've sown in prayer. What you say after you pray, your confession is just as important as your prayer life. Because if your confession is different from your prayers, you've sown, you, you've literally adopted a double mindset. And in doing so, the Bible says you ought not to receive anything from the Lord. So there's a time to pray, and then there's a time to say. You've prayed about it, now call it. Speak it into existence. The Bible says he called those things which be not. That's how God created the earth. He said, let there be light, and there was. You know, words were first used. Listen to this. Words were first used for dominion over darkness. And God said, let there be light. Words were then used for creation. And God said, let there be the stars of the heaven, the, 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 the vegetation of the earth. So your words were first used for dominion over darkness. Words were then used for creation. And then lastly, for communication. And God walked with Adam in the cool of the day. But the church, all we do is talk about the communication part. We need to pray. We need to pray. We need to pray. Prayer is important. But there's a time to pray and there's a time to say. And the first two primary purposes for words that God used and, and, and demonstrated in Genesis 1 was for dominion and creation. Use your words to create the, the future that you desire to have. Use your words to create the future that you desire to have. Use your words to exercise your dominion over the devil. Enough is enough. I refuse to see the devil's face another day in my, in, my, in my life and in my home. I refuse to tolerate depression. I take dominion. I take authority over every satanic weapon that's been designed to wipe me out. It shall not prosper. Use your words. Pray and then say. Those are 15 lies the devil tries to pitch our generation. Part one and part two. And you know what? I might even make this into a book, have it transcribed and get it 15 chapters written out into a book because it's so important. This message has to go out. Let me pray for everyone that's watching right now. Father, as they've tuned in, those on part one and part two, if it's just part two, as they've heard the word of truth spoken today, I pray you said that my light will shine in darkness and darkness can't do anything about it. That the dominion of darkness, of light over darkness is instant and it's unquestionable. As the light of your word has gone out to cover whatever lie that people might have bought that have come on this broadcast saying, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's just my lot in life. I pray, Father, any lie that I've gone through as I've shown the light of your word on it to expose the work of darkness that was designed to keep them at a low level in life. I pray, Father, let the chains of the enemy be broken and let their, their promotion commence immediately. In the name of Jesus, I see the hand of God reaching into the miry... I see it, I see it, I see it. The hand of God reaching into that 
deceptive pit that the enemy's kept you in and he's stretching. God is lifting you out of it right now. He's lifting you out of it right now. He's lifting you out of it right now. Today's the lowest you'll ever be. You're moving forward. You're going upward in Jesus' mighty name. As Satan's lies are dissolved, his works will soon follow. Not soon follow. They follow immediately. Light is being, is being blasted. into you right now. If you're watching right now and you've never given your life to Jesus, you need to get saved right now. This is step number one. If you have given your life to the Lord, but you have fallen away, maybe some bad experience, whatever happened, challenge that wiped you out, maybe you were like the seed that was sown on shallow ground and immediately tribulation or trouble arose, you you withered up. You're not serving the Lord quite like you should. I want you to I want you to pray this prayer with me. If you've never done it or you have, but you want to rededicate your life to Jesus, I want you to pray this with me from the bottom of your heart. Say this with me. Say, Father, in Jesus' name, I believe that you raised Jesus from the dead. I confess Christ is my Lord. Forgive me of my sin. Where I was weak, make me strong. I turn to you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and I'll never turn away. From today... I'm going with you. I drop hands with this world and I join hands with Jesus and I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, I'd love for you to get in contact with me, salvationnow.ca. First link that pops up is I just got saved. Click it, click that link, fill it out. I wanna get something to you free of charge. It's a, um, a, a Bible and some other resources that are gonna greatly help you in your walk with Christ, free of charge, no handling, we're not going to send you letters, we need money, we don't ever do that, we're never going to do that, we have all our needs met, I just want to bless you, I want to help you, I want to get some important resources in your hands, so that's free of charge, if you prayed that prayer with me, and you meant it with all your heart, I want you to reach out to us on salvation.ca. Stay connected with us by visiting us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook by searching at TJ Malkanji, or visit us online www.salvationnow.ca. God bless you and until next time.